<laughs> All right. So last but not least, we have Tiger Lu. He's going to be talking about exoplanets. So he's a third year PhD student in the astronomy department at here at Yale. Um, yeah. All good. All right. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Very excited. Very happy to be here at our first science cafe in three years uh, to tell you guys all about exoplanets and the search for life. This is one of the most exciting and fastest growing subfields in astronomy right now. So you guys picked a good time to learn about exoplanets. Yeah. But first, a little bit about me. So I grew up in Shanghai, China. I, um, I was born in the U.S., but I spent my kind of high school years in China. Uh, this, is my, this is my second grade teacher, Ms. Sarah Barlow, who I'm actually still sometimes in contact with. Uh, and she was kind of the one who got me into astronomy in the first place. Uh, I also was lucky enough to do a summer program at Johns Hopkins in middle school, also in astronomy, and that kind of confirmed my interest in more of the research side of things. Uh, these are two really cool books that I read that got me even further into the field of physics and astronomy. So if you're interested, these are The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene and A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. They'll also be put later in the slides, so check them out if you're interested. Uh, yeah, I, I knew I wanted to pursue astronomy as a career, so I was lucky enough to go to Caltech to do my undergraduate studies as an astrophysics major. Uh, these are two of my professors that had a big impact on me, Konstantin Batygin and Professor Mike Brown. This guy here is kind of infamously known as the guy who killed Pluto. Uh, and uh, yeah, but that's a story for another time. Uh, and yeah, it was a great experience. And in my time at Caltech, I went to some really cool places like the Palomar and Mount Wilson observatories. These are huge telescopes that are being used right now to do very cutting edge science as we speak. Uh, and yeah, now I'm here. I am a current graduate student at Yale. Uh, I'm very, work very lucky to be working with Professor Gregory Laughlin, who's uh, one of the foremost experts in exoplanets today. Uh, a fun fact, I'd like to run. This is a picture of me running with um, Josie, who is one of our great organizers, who unfortunately wasn't able to be here today, but I'm sure some of you guys have seen her around. And yeah, I'm interested in planets. Uh, my first year project was involving the planet Uranus, and I looked at an attempt to explain its bizarre tilt. But what I'm really here to talk about today, uh, the title of my talk, is exoplanets. So um, one question that you guys might have at this point is, uh, what is an exoplanet exactly? And this turns out to be a slightly more complicated question that you might expect, so let's simplify it a little bit. Can anyone tell me what is a planet? Just shout it out, shout it out. A planet, yes. <laughs> yeah. A huge rock, sure, yeah. Yeah. Any other ideas? Sorry? A huge asteroid, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah? Just shout it out, shout it out. Yeah, go for it. Dust, Dust and rock, spheres? Yeah. 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 Something that orbits something in space. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm looking for here. So a planet is a large body that's orbiting our sun. And we're all familiar with the eight planets in our own solar system. There's us right there, the third planet from the sun. Uh, and yeah, we're all familiar with the eight other planets in our solar system. Uh, now, again, all these planets are orbiting the sun here. And while the sun is great, uh, I love the sun. It provides us with light, warmth, all that good stuff. But, um, but the cold hard truth is that at the end of the day, honestly, the sun's really not that special, right? Uh, so uh, if you go out, not here sadly because it's too polluted, but if you went out somewhere far away from any light pollution and you looked up at the sky, you might see something a little bit like this, right? The Milky Way and tons of stars in the sky, right? Every single one of those tiny points of light is a star, right? Uh, and if you zoomed in on one of them, many of these would look just like our sun, right? Uh, but remember, I just told you guys that the sun is not special, right? So if we have planets around our sun, why would we not expect planets around all these other stars? Uh, well, we do. And we do actually see planets around these stars, right? 
so now we get to answer the original question that I wanted to pose to you guys. What is an exoplanet? And an exoplanet is a planet that orbits another star, right? And I'm going to play a video now that is going to show you uh, the discovery of exoplanets, starting from the first exoplanet discovered in 1991. Uh, I want to note that time is constant in this video, so the time is just going to keep rolling, and exoplanets are going to be discovered very, very quickly. Uh, the time is not speeding up. We're just discovering exoplanets a lot faster. I really want to emphasize that there is this is incredibly significant research that is going to change our understanding of the universe that's being done right now, right? Yeah, so that's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So a natural question you might have, right? Uh, these are tiny stars, right? The, all we see are these tiny little, tiny little points of light. How are we supposed to find these even tinier planets orbiting these tiny points of light, right? That's a great question. Uh, so uh, in this video here, every single one of these little circles represents a different method scientists use to discover exoplanets. Every color of the circle represents a different method. I'm going to focus on the two of the biggest methods we use, the radial velocity method and the transit method. These are the red and the blue circles, right? And yeah, here are our two methods, and I'm going to be talking about the RV or radial velocity method first. And the RV method is really based on the Doppler effect, which many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, essentially, the Doppler effect tells us that a source of sound moving towards you will seem more high-pitched, and the opposite is true if it's moving away from you. Uh, many of you will have seen this demonstration in your physics classes. So let's imagine you standing there, and let's have an ambulance drive by you, right? So that's, that's pretty noticeable, right? Yeah. So... What if I told you that light actually does the exact same thing? What do I mean by this? Let me explain, right? So you might have seen this picture a few times. What's going on here? Well, if you pass white light through a prism, what happens is it breaks up into every color in the rainbow, a perfect rainbow spectrum. You can kind of think of white light as kind of containing every color we know of. Uh, now, this is true for perfectly white light, uh, and nothing is perfect, right? So let's take hydrogen, which is the most common element in the universe, as an example. Uh, what happens when we look at this white light through some hydrogen? Essentially, what we're doing here is we're using hydrogen as a filter. Uh, and uh, kind of as a side note, uh, this is what's actually happening when we look at stars. The perfect white light of the star has to pass through the atmosphere of the star, which is made of hydrogen, before it gets to us. Uh, so yeah, what do we see? Well, instead of seeing this perfect rainbow spectrum that we would normally see with just white light, uh, we're going to see lines in this spectrum. Uh, these are called absorption lines. Uh, and, um, and let's look at it from your perspective now. What happens if you see hydrogen moving towards you. Well, what happens is these lines are going to be slightly shifted in the blue direction. We're going to call this blue shift, right? And the opposite is true if the hydrogen is moving away from you. We're going to call this red shift. Now, this is pretty cool, but how is this relevant? How does this help us find exoplanets? Uh, well, it, it comes down to how planets orbit their stars. So if you have a star just by itself with no planet, it's not going to be moving. It's just going to be perfectly stationary. Uh, let's add a planet here now. Uh, and you might think of a planet's orbit as just looking like this, uh, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than this. 
uh, a star and a planet actually orbit their mutual center of mass. Uh, and since the star is a lot bigger, the center of mass is very close to the star, so the star barely moves. But the important thing is that the star is moving very slightly, right? And let's look at this from your perspective now, right? Uh, since the star is moving on its own orbit, uh, during certain phases of its orbit, it's moving towards you. And you're going to see these lines shifted in the blue direction. Move on to this phase of its orbit, and now the star is moving away from you. And now our, star, now our lines are redshifted. So astronomers can measure these tiny shifts in the absorption lines and detect planets. And here's a nice movie to show you exactly what's going on. You'll see now the planet's moving away from you, the lines move towards red, and now it's coming towards you, it's moving in the blue direction, right? Cool, so that was the radial velocity method. Next, let's talk about the transit method. And don't worry, this method is a lot simpler. Uh, the transit method really takes advantage of one fact, the star is a lot brighter than the planet, right? So let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at the amount of light we see when we look at a star, right? In this stage of its orbit, the planet is right next to the star. So let's say we get, for example, this amount of light. Uh, now, as the planet moves in its orbit, it's going to start blocking part of the star you have a dim object that's blocking part of a bright object. And the amount of light we get from the star is going to slightly decrease. In this stage of its orbit, the entire planet is blocking the star. So the amount of light we're getting is at its lowest. Then it's going to pass through its orbit, light is going to come back, and we proceed. So if we look at a star long enough and look at how much light we're getting from it, and we see this kind of dip over and over again, that's a pretty good sign that there's probably a planet there. So now, of course, the, the big question in everyone's mind, right? Uh, we can find planets. Can we find life on these planets? Uh, so this, at first, seems like a pretty simple question, but it, it, gets, pretty, it gets pretty complicated quickly. Um, I think everyone here would agree that bananas are pretty different from humans, right? No. Right? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I don't know. But would it surprise you to know that bananas and humans actually share 50% of their DNA? So this, this begs the question, right? We, we, we share a planet with bananas. Why would we expect any aliens who we don't share DNA with, who we don't share a planet with, to be more similar to us than bananas, right? So my answer to this question is, what exactly is life? Right? So let's ask a slightly easier question. Uh, can we find life as we know it, life that we would recognize? Uh, well, if you thought finding tiny planets around tiny stars was hard, uh, just imagine how hard it is to find tiny lizards, for example, on these tiny planets around these tiny stars. It seems incredibly difficult, right? Uh, it turns out that there is some very cutting-edge research that's right now that's working on tackling this question. Uh, I'm not going to get into this right now because it's really advanced stuff, but for now, let's say the answer is probably not, right? So let's ask an even easier question. We only have one example of a planet where life can flourish, Earth, right? So let's look for more Earths. Can we find more Earth-like exoplanets? Now, it turns out that this is also very hard. We have a lot of examples of large planets, large Jupiter-like planets. These have very big effects, and they're pretty easy to detect. Uh, Earth-like planets are a lot smaller. They're a lot harder to detect. Uh, using the radial velocity method, you would need to be able to detect a star moving at 10 centimeters per second to find an Earth-like planet in a sun-like orbit, right? Uh, 10 centimeters per second is really slow. That's about how slow lava moves. So this is... Detecting a tiny star moving at that speed is really, really hard. Uh, it's just as hard using the transit method. You need to detect a 0.01% dip in the brightness of a star to find an Earth-like planet in an Earth-like orbit around a Sun-like star using the transit method. Uh, but, but let's back up a second, right? I've told you how to find these exoplanets. 
uh, a natural question is, how do we know if an exoplanet is Earth-like or not? Uh, it, it turns out we can actually figure this out if we have both RV and transit measurements. Uh, the RV method will tell you how heavy a planet is or how massive it is, right? It's mass. Uh, the transit method tells you how big a planet is. It's volume. What happens if you put these two together? You get a mass over volume, the amount of stuff in a body, aka its density, right? Uh, we can compare the density we measure for an exoplanet to values we know in the solar system to get some idea of, what's, of its composition. For example, Earth is a rocky planet. It's pretty dense. Earth's density is about five grams per centimeter cubed. Jupiter, on the other hand, is a gas giant. It's a lot less dense. Jupiter's density is about one gram per centimeter cubed. Uh, so depending on the density we measure with these two methods, we're able to draw some sort of conclusion on what kind of planet we found. So using this density method, here is a breakdown of the planets we found so far. Now you'll notice that most of these are larger gas worlds. These are a lot easier to detect just because they're so much bigger. But we have found a few planets that we do care about, right? We found a, few, we found a small fraction of these Earth-like terrestrial worlds. These 4% are the planets we really care about, planets we'd like to find more of, right? So let me tell you a bit more about what we're currently trying to do to find these worlds. Here are a few pictures of EXPRESS, the Extreme Precision Spectrometer. This is a telescope in Lowell, Arizona, which is run by a team right here at Yale. Uh, and here are some pictures taken directly by one of my colleagues on the EXPRESS team. Uh, it's a pretty big telescope. This is, um, this is that colleague. He looks pretty tiny, doesn't he? And, uh, and EXPRESS uses the radial velocity method and is able to measure speeds down to 30 centimeters per second. Uh, but wait, uh, something doesn't seem right here, right? Didn't I tell you you need 10 centimeters per second to detect an Earth-like planet? Well, let, let, let's be clear. I, I didn't lie to you. Uh, this statement is absolutely true. You need 10 centimeter per second precision to detect an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. Uh, but what if, we, what if we just ignored the second part of the sentence, right? What if we just care about finding an Earth-like planet? Uh, I'm going to explain why this is still fine, why we can ignore the second part. But I'm going to take a brief tangent here, and I promise it's relevant, right? And what, what it really comes down to is liquid water. Uh, liquid water, from what we can tell, is the one thing that's absolutely vital for life. In the most otherwise inhospitable environments, uh, such as deep sea vents and, and, and hot springs, wherever there is water, life has thrived. And where there's no water, life does not exist. So our search for life then is, in our search for life, it's key to look for planets where liquid water can exist. What planets might those be? Well, that depends on a few things. So let's use our own solar system as an example. Uh, let's look at the three inner planets, three of the inner planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Uh, Venus is too close to our sun. Uh, it's too hot, and any liquid water would immediately evaporate. On the other hand, Mars is too far away. Liquid water would freeze before it became anything useful. In between these zones, there's a small band that's not too hot and not too cold. You may have heard this call, be called the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. In our solar system, Earth fits in this zone, and this is the zone that liquid water can exist. Uh, now let's think about other solar systems, right? Let's say we replaced our sun with a giant hot star. What would change? Well, since the star is so much hotter, uh, you have to be further away from the star for liquid water to exist. The habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone gets a little bit further out. Now let's think about what happens if you take a small, cooler star. Uh, since the star is a lot colder, uh, you can get a lot closer to the star and still have liquid water on your planet. So the habitable zone is a lot closer to the star. Uh, it turns out that star planets around smaller stars are a lot easier to detect, and planets much closer to their stars are also a lot easier to detect. So these are really the planets we're going to be searching for now. Planets around small stars that are easier to detect, which can still support liquid water on their surfaces. 
Here are a few examples of some of the Earth-like worlds we've discovered so far. And I want to draw your attention to how close all of them are to their host stars. For example, just for some reference, Mercury's orbit is 88 days. So all of these planets are very close to their host stars. Uh, so far, we've found about 15 of these Earth-like worlds. Uh, the Express team has ambitiously embarked on what they have called the 100 Earths project, which is exactly what it sounds like. We hope to find 100 of these Earth-like planets by the year 2050. Uh, this is an incredibly exciting time in astronomy, and many interesting planet candidates are being looked at as we speak right now. So yeah, thank you all for your attention. Hopefully we find one of these very soon. Uh, the books I mentioned are right here, and I'll take any questions. Okay, so we have, we have time for a few questions. Do our sun circle also, like, like the planet does? Yes, our sun does circle. So if you, were to, uh, if you were an alien looking at our sun, hypothetically, you would be able to see these little wobbles. Uh, it wobbles a lot less than the stars we see, right? Because the largest planets are very far out. So m the Jupiter, although it's very big, is so far from the sun that it does have a very small wobble. And all the close-in planets are so small that they don't produce much wobble. But yes, the sun is wobbling slightly, just not very much. We have a question. Go ahead. You first, yeah. When the sun moves away from the Earth, does the color change? Sorry? Does the color change when the sun moves away from the Earth? Very slightly, yes, yes. Def and I, I, wa I, wa I just want to say all the effects that you see, all the effects I mentioned, these are tiny, tiny changes, and you wouldn't be able to see them with your eyes. But using precise measurements, scientists are able to detect these tiny changes in color, and that's how we detect planets. Um, yeah. When you said that an exoplanet moves around the sun, um, does that happen when the sun moves, moves around the Earth slightly with the star in the exoplanet? Sorry, can you say that again? When you said... And that an exoplanet moves around the star, that the star also moves around. Yeah. Does that also happen to the sun? Yes, it also happens to the sun. The same, so yeah, like I said, the sun's not special at all, right? So the sun is also moving in our solar system. Now, again, I, will, I also want, just want to say that for, not just for the sun, but all of these systems, right? The star is barely moving because it's so much bigger compared to the planets. But it, the fact that it does move at all is how we can detect planets. Yeah. We have one over here. So, would you say that um, our star is like on this, the, our sun is on the smallest side of like stars? Our sun is probably an average to maybe slightly below average size star. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one last question. How many planets are there in all? In all? Over 5,000 that we've discovered. We've discovered 5,000. There could be many, many more yet to be discovered. All right. Let's uh, thank Tiger again.